Hello and welcome fellow coders. It is a pleasure seeing you here waiting for the third, but sadly, last part of this Testify series. We have already talked about the different types of assertions as well as how to write testing suites. So today's topic will be mocking. And boy oh boy am I excited. But if you haven't watched the previous two parts, make sure to check them out before you dive into this one. To fully understand what I'm going to talk about, sorry bro, you have to take the full package. Now without any further ado, Let's get mocking. First of all, let's talk about what mocking is and what problem it solves. Imagine writing a REST authentication service. One very common and simple way to structure your code is the controller service repository architecture. In lamest terms, the controller will deal with all the HTTP requests and responses. The service will deal with all the business logic. And lastly, the repository will deal with all the database queries. So super common and nothing fancy. For the explanation, let's focus on the service as well as the repository. If you were to implement the service, the interface could look something like this. It could define an auth function which takes an email as well as a password as arguments and returns a token and an error. Since the service will be accountable for authenticating as well as issuing the token, it needs to have the user information. So the corresponding struct must contain the user repository in order to retrieve data from the database. As for the user repository itself, it could have a super simple user function which retrieves a user by its email address. And as I explained earlier, the data is stored in the database, so the corresponding user repository struct must contain the database connection. So far so good. But let us now talk about the fun stuff, and that is testing. If you were to write a test for the auth function, you would need to use the repository in order to retrieve user information. And as I showed you a moment ago, the repository itself would use a database connection to fetch the data from it. But the hard truth is, and bear with me because this is a tough one, you don't always have a database connection. Yeah, I know, being a programmer can sometimes be very tough. Okay, jokes aside now. Even if you don't have a database, you still want to write tests for your code in order to verify if it's working correctly. And that is exactly where mocking comes into play. Imagine you could simply take your repository, replace it by a mock, and all of a sudden, all your problems are gone. But how should this work? Well, glad you asked. Generally speaking, you can use mocks to simulate behavior. In Go, a mock is nothing more than a struct. And in order to simulate behavior on the struct, you need to tell it what to do under specific conditions. Let me give you an example. For instance, you can tell it that when the user function gets called on the mock and an unknown email gets passed as an argument, then it should return an error with a specific error message. Now let's get back to our test. I hope you can understand now that if you want to test your service, you can simply use a mock instead of a repository, simulate the behavior of it and run your test cases without a real database connection. How awesome is that? Pretty awesome, right? Okay, enough of the theory. Let's get down to business. As our first line of duty, let's get rid of the database. In our case, that means stopping the Docker container our Postgres is running in. Now with the database out of our way, we can point our attention to our test cases. But first, let me quickly go over the code that we will mock today. In case you haven't watched my first two videos, make sure to check them out so you can follow along. So let's revisit the price increase calculator. I have already written integration tests for the price increase calculator and today I'm going to write unit tests for it. You can see right here that the price increase calculator holds an instance of a price provider of the stocks package. So, in order to unit test the price increase calculator, we have to mock the price provider of the stocks package. And after we have written the mock, we can use the new price increase calculator function, passing in our mock as an argument, and populate the field in the struct. The price provider interface itself looks like this. It is an interface defining two functions. And remember what I told you in the beginning, in Golang, a mock is nothing more than a struct. So it's absolutely logical that our struct needs to implement these two functions. That is why we can use the mock to simulate behavior. If you want to create a mock in Go, there are actually two best practices that you can follow. You can either create a designated mocks package and put all your mock files into it, or you can create a separate file right next to the actual business logic file and suffix it with underscore mock. Even though I prefer the first option, for educational purposes, I'm going to choose the latter one for now. Let me quickly copy the interface because I'm going to need it in a second. 
So to finally write our mock, let's start by creating a new file and calling it stocks underscore mock dot go. Now let's clean this all up, define the package and paste our interface. The first thing we need to do is to create our mock struct. If you put your mock into the same package as your regular code, it's a best practice to name your struct the same way as your interface and prefix or suffix it with mock. That way you can easily distinguish between the interface and the mock. The next thing we need to do is kind of mark our struct as a mock. Luckily Testify provides us with a super simple way of doing so. The only thing we need to do is to use the composition pattern and embed the mock struct of Testify's mock package. This mock struct provides us with a whole bunch of additional functionality that we need in order to simulate behavior. I will show you in a minute how this exactly works. But before I can do that, we need to turn these two functions into member functions so that our struct implements the price provider interface. Let us start with the second one. Because it has an argument, I can show you a few more concepts with it. The first thing we need to do is to call the called function on our mock. If you have a closer look at the called function itself, you can see that it tells the mocked object that the method has been called. A peek at the function signature tells us that the called function takes some arguments and also returns some kind of arguments object. We will get into that in a second. Back at our mock, let's pass in the date argument and store the returned arguments in a variable. That is the arguments object I was talking about. We can now use this arguments object to kind of retrieve the return values. I know that this does not make sense now, but it will as soon as we see how we use the mock. Looking at the methods of the arguments object, we can see that it has a whole bunch of functions that return a specific type at a given index. Like for instance the int function right here. Int gets the argument at the specified index. The way how this works is pretty straightforward. Let's assume that our list function would return an integer as the first return value. We would then call the int function with the index 0. For return types that are self-defined like the price data slice right here, we can use the get function. The get function has interface as its return type. So we have to make sure that our return value has the correct type by type asserting it. Since our second return type is error, it's pretty straightforward now. Simply call the error function of the arguments object and pass in the index 1. Ok, the compiler seems to be happy, but I'm definitely not. That is because we simply assume that the one calling the function knows what he or she is doing. But that is definitely not always the case. Since we are all human, we know that sometimes the IDE does not quite get what we are trying to say. So it misinterprets our code and that kids is how bugs are born. Unfortunately, we coders don't like bugs, so we have to try to prevent them. Imagine we wouldn't have a first element in our arcs, so this call would panic. So before casting, we have to check if this part is nil first. To do that, let's first define a variable called R0, standing for return value at index 0, of type slice price data. We also need a second variable holding the actual value called v0 which stands for value at index 0. Now we can go ahead and check if our value is not nil and if that's the case we can store it into r0 and type assert it. What's left to do is replacing the first part of the return statement with r0. Ok cool, we have at least eliminated one potential problem. But unfortunately we have to do the exact same thing with the second return value. I will go ahead and speed this up because it works the same way as for r0. Even though this looks much better, we are still not finished yet. Before type asserting, we have to check if the variable is indeed of the correct type. Like for instance if v0 is of type slice price data. So we have to introduce another check and then do the same thing for the second variable and to make things even worse, we haven't even touched the latest function. <sighs> you know what? Let's do what every reasonable programmer would do. Delete this file, grab a cup of coffee and complain about management. After we have enjoyed our refreshing beverage, we can go ahead use Mockery to let it generate the mocks for us. Essentially, Mockery is a CLI tool with a whole bunch of options. I will not go over these because one simple command is all that we need. But first we need to install it. So hop over to the installation section and pick the one that suits you best. I'm going with the go get command. So simply copy it, paste it into the terminal, press enter and I'm good to go. I have already done that, so I can skip this step. Now all you need to do is type in mockery dash dash all, hit enter and you can already see that it has generated mocks for our interfaces. If you open up the folder structure you can see two things. First we have some problems with our dependencies and second this mocks directory right here. First let's deal with our dependencies. Simply use the go mod tidy command and all your problems should be gone. 
Now let's have a closer look at the MOX directory. You can immediately see that two files have been generated, one for each interface. So let's have a closer look at the generated price provider mock and compare it to the one we have written ourselves. To no surprise, Mockery has generated a price provider struct that embeds the mock struct of Testify. And it also has generated the member functions to implement the interface. Looking at the latest function, you can immediately see the similarities to our self-written mock. First the call function of the mock, then all the checks on the return values, which get checked properly, and lastly the return statement itself. If we scroll down a bit, you can see that the list function looks almost identical. As for our price increase calculator interface, Mockery has also generated a mock struct and implemented the price increase function. I know what you're thinking right now. If we can use Mockery for generating our mocks, why did we write one from scratch? Well, I personally think that it's always good to know how things work on the inside. So if you run into any problems or have to debug the mock, you can find the solution faster and more easily. Okay, but now that we have our mocks in place, let's hop into the test and I can show you how you can use them. First of all, I'm going to use a test suite again. If you don't know how these work, make sure to check out the second video of this series. For now, I will just paste code from my notes and then quickly go over it. First we have the definition of a unit test suite. Next the function that runs our test suite in case the go test command gets executed. And then there is the first test case, which I will explain from bottom up. As I told you in the beginning of this tutorial, I will be using the new price increase calculator function to populate the calculator with the price provider instance. An instance of the price provider itself gets generated right here. And you can see that it takes a database connection as an argument. Well, but since we don't have a database, that is exactly where our mock comes into play. First, let's get rid of these two lines right here and then let's generate an instance of a price provider mock. We can now take this instance and use it as an argument to our new price increase calculator function. C works like a charm. Now I'm going to show you how you can use this mock in order to simulate behavior of the price provider. The first step is to use the on function. The documentation tells you that it starts a description of an expectation of the specified method being called. In lamer terms, it starts the simulation of the behavior. And we can also see that the first argument is the method name and the second argument is a list of further arguments that the mock uses to call the function. Let's again have a look at the list function of the price provider mock to see exactly how it's going to work. The list function takes a time instance as an argument and has these two return values. Back in our test, we can now use list as our first argument of the on function and an instance of time as our second. So for now, let's just take no, pun intended. Next we have to define our return values. Since our first return type is the slice of price data, let's go with an empty slice. The second return value is an error, so let's just go with nil. This simple line is basically a perfect mocking of behavior. You can read it as follows. Dear mock, if the list function gets called on you and time now gets passed as an argument, please return an empty slice of price data and nil. That's fairly simple, right? But let us now prepare our mock to return price data that we can actually use to test our functionality. The first price data point will have a timestamp of now and a price of 2. The second price data point will have a timestamp that is 1 minute in the past. And the price is going to be 1. So the price increase from the second point to the first point is 100%, since the price of 2 is 2 times the price of 1. Hence, 100% price increase. Now that we have mocked our behavior and know exactly what the price provider will return, we can now call the price increase function of our calculator and verify if it's working correctly. Therefore, we are going to assert that the actual value is equal to 100 and also that the error is nil. Now let's go ahead and run our test case. I will only run the tests in the calculations package and I'm also using the run flag with the unit test suite argument to make sure that only this suite gets tested. As you can see, the test case is failing. So let us check why this is the case. You can see that the expected timestamp seem to differ from the actual one. And if you have a closer look, the actual timestamp is only slightly ahead. So there seems to be a problem with the arguments we are using in our test case. The problem is that I'm using time now as an argument to our mock. This actually tells our mock that it should return the defined values only if the argument is the current timestamp. But if we have a look at the actual implementation of the list function, it uses the current timestamp as well. So these two timestamps can never be the same. That is why our defined mock never kicked in and our test failed. But how do we solve this problem now? Of course, one solution can be to rewrite the whole code, but sometimes that is no option, because it would take ages or you mock external libraries. If the argument you are passing does not matter, or like in our case, you don't have a choice, you can always use mock.anything as an argument. This way you are telling your mock, no matter what argument you are getting, please return the defined values. In almost all cases that is perfectly fine, because your test cases should be small and concise anyways. And see, now our test passes. Alrighty. 
Let me give you a second example of how you can use mocks in order to simulate behavior. If you have a look at the price increase function again, you can see that it returns an error in case we have less than two price data points. So let's mock that. First we need to get rid of the elements in our slice and then we can change the assertions accordingly. The actual value should be zero, whereas the error should now equal not enough data. Now let's run our test again and see if this test case works as well. And here we go, the test works perfectly. The next thing I would like to show you is how your mocks behave if you have several tests. Obviously we need a second test for that and I can use this opportunity to show you how you can mock errors. Our test case should validate that the price increase function should return an error in case the price provider returns an error. So let's first create an expected error and pass it to our mock so it gets returned on the list call. See how easy it is to simulate different behaviors using mocks. Awesome, right? What's left to do is to assert that our actual error is indeed equal to the expected error. So let's pass in both values in the equal function and we are done with the second test case. Now let's go ahead and check if our test suite is still passing. Yep, everything is good. Okay, cool. But as you can see, we have a bit of duplicate code, which as a matter of fact is no biggie in this case, but if the code you're testing is very complex and you maybe have five different mocks, all your test cases become cluttered very soon because you have duplicate code in every single one of them. To prevent that, let's use our testing suite or in more detail the setup suite lifecycle and put the setup of our tests into it. Since we want to reuse our mock as well as our calculator, we need to store these into our unit test suite struct. Apologies for repeating myself, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, please make sure to check out the second part of this tutorial series. So now that we have our fields in place, we can now use them to fix our tests. See, that is the good part. We don't need the setup right here. Look how beautiful, small and concise our test cases have become. Isn't that great? But I have accidentally built in a bug. Maybe you can figure it out for yourself. I will leave the error message on the screen for a few seconds so you can think about it. Do you have an idea? Let's go over it. To be honest, the error messages aren't that helpful. So it was kind of a trick question. Sorry about that. So let me explain what is happening right here. You can see that the error from price provider test fails. That is because we used the same mock as in the previous test case. If you want to reuse a mock, keep in mind that calling on and returning it influences all the other test cases. So always make sure that you create a new mock for every single test case. For us this means taking the setup suite function, which gets executed only once for this testing suite, and replace it with the setup test function. The setup test function gets executed before every single test case. This way we can make sure that we always have a newly created mock. And as you can see, our testing suite now works perfectly. Ok, so far we have learned how we can create mocks and how to use them to simulate behavior. But there's actually one last cool thing that I wanted to show you and that is that you can use your mock to write specific assertions. You can see right here that our mock provides us with four different assert functions. All these functions verify that the mock was used or not used in a specific way. The simplest way to verify that your mock has been used correctly is by using the assert expectations function. Basically what this does is assert that everything that we defined on the mock gets called and returned the way we defined it. This works for most cases, but sometimes you want to be a little bit more specific. That is where the other functions come into play. If you're not using assert expectations, you can use assert called or assert not called to verify that a certain function has been called or, well, not called. The assert not called function can be very useful if you want to test behavior under specific conditions or edge cases. Let's say we would also have a notifier that sends a message to a Slack channel each time the price increases above 100%. Using the assert not called function, we would now be able to assert that the send function does not get called in case the price increases below 100. Lastly, we have the assert number of calls function. You can use that to verify that a function of your mock has been called a specific number of times. Let's say for instance we would have five different Slack channels and every single one of them should receive a message in case the price increases above 100. We can now use the assert number of calls function to verify that the send function of the notifier actually got called five times. As you can see, you can use the assert functions of your mock to verify that the function using the mock actually behaves correctly. Well, that concludes my Testify series. With all the things you have learned, you have now become a fully equipped testing master. Now go ahead and write some tests. Wait, you have forgotten to hit the like button and also to write Go Testify Go into the comments to share some love for their awesome work. Thanks, much appreciated. And until next time, keep on coding.